I am a very weird person, and because of that, I've long been fascinated by the process of faking games. Not to be confused with making games, though that's pretty darn fascinating in its own right. Video games are an increasingly important part of our culture, so it's only natural that people would want to tell stories about them. And because of the obvious legal and creative limitations that come with writing about existing intellectual properties, that often requires designing entire fictional games to build these stories around. Making a good fake video game and presenting it in a believable manner is a challenge not just of game design know-how, but of world-building skills and narrative logic. It takes a lot to get it right. And this anime season has brought us not one, but two VR MMO anime that I think get it very right. Bofuri and Infinite Dendrogram. So how does one go about using video game elements and the principles of game design to tell a good story in other mediums? Somewhere between these two series, I think we can find the answer to that question. When I first set out to write this video, I initially wanted to explore why I find the broken, imbalanced, at times player-hostile design of SAO to be so unappealing, while the broken, imbalanced, at times player-hostile design of Infinite Dendrogram seems like it would make for pretty much the best game ever. But as soon as I started actually writing the thing, I realized that the answer to that is a lot simpler than it first appears. Like most things in game design, it's a question of context. SAO the game is structured as a dungeon crawler with MMO bits, where players technically have the option to choose any playstyle they want, but any playstyle that doesn't involve either using swords to indeaden things or making swords and other equipment for the players doing the indeadening is kinda useless when it comes to pursuing the game's primary goal of clearing dungeons and killing bosses to reach the top of Aincrad. That clear, universal goal likewise makes it just super duper unfair that some lucky players like Kirito can gain access to unique abilities that no one else has that double their DPS and therefore make it objectively easier for them to accomplish that goal than anyone else playing. Infinite Dendrogram, the game, meanwhile, is billed as a fully simulated sandbox, where players are encouraged to create their own playstyles, set their own goals, and ultimately find their own meaning in the play experience. And while the embryo system at least superficially resembles SAO's unique skill system, that difference in objectives makes, well, all the difference in the experience. Ray Starling's Vengeance is Mine, which allows him to pay back damage dealt to him by a single enemy double, gives him a pretty significant and obvious advantage when it comes to fighting big bosses. And it would totally break a game like SAO, but in Infinite Dendrogram, where players can be merchants, politicians, entertainers, journalists, secret evil NPC genocide societies, or weird perverts in penguin costumes who use fake potions to trick other players into fulfilling their Nekomimi fetishes, and all of those choices are treated as equally valid, how does one even quantify what abilities are truly more powerful than others? Like stands in JoJo, it's less about what you have and more about how you use it. Embryos as a design feature undeniably have downsides, just look at how unbalanced PvP can be in this game, but they support Infinite Dendrogram's central design goal of limitless player freedom and self-expression. And most of the other features we've seen in the game so far likewise support that intended experience. Even the much maligned 24-hour logout penalty clearly exists to ensure that players feel like their choices have meaningful consequences. As is the case with real video games, it's that intentionality and synergy in design that makes Dendrogram a good fake game where SAO is a kinda bad one. But that's just the start of this discussion, because, of course, a good fake video game does not automatically make for a good fake video game anime. Like Stans in JoJo, it's less about what you have and more about how you use it. Bofuri provides a great point of contrast to Infinite Dendrogram, because the fake game at its center, New World Online, isn't all that well designed. In fact, it's kind of a shit show. Some of its systems have seemingly been lifted straight from SAO, specifically the FF2-esque way that skills are acquired and leveled through repeated use. And right off the bat, the anime demonstrates how a player who knows what they're doing, or rather doesn't at all, could literally exploit such a system in their sleep. Bofuri is a comedy built around the rather ingenious premise of throwing an uncannily lucky ditzy moe protagonist into the very serious world of a competitive VR MMO, and the fact that the fake video game at its core is kinda bad only enhances the comedic aspects of the series. This purposefully inept design also allows the show to realistically depict an aspect of gaming that most other titles in this subgenre kinda ignore, that gamers really like to complain about things. 
When other players see our heroine Maple dominate the game's first PvP event, the conversation almost immediately shifts from praising her skill as a newbie to discussing how obviously broken her character build is, which prompts the game's designers to patch in a balance fix, and from that point forward, they're stuck playing catch-up as she moes her way into newer, scarier exploits every time they think they've finally reined her in. The player community, meanwhile, finds itself a little torn on Maple, because on the one hand, she represents some significant significant game balance issues that really do need to be fixed, but on the other, she's the most lovable cinnamon roll that ever existed, and her perfect smile must be protected at all costs. And on that note, the social features of New World Online have a much more significant impact on Bofuri's story than any of its combat or character building mechanics do. Though the big fights in the show are exciting and well produced, they're mostly incidental to Bofuri's A-plot, which follows Maple as she grows from a timid newbie and outsider to the gamer culture of WCW NWO into a veteran player and valued member of the community. So learning about MMO etiquette, adding other players to her friends list, mostly quirky, adorable girls for some reason, and creating a guild end up being much more significant milestones for her than beating any particular boss. The really important battles in the series are always a team effort. Maple's individual victories are largely treated as trivial, except in the sense that they add to the community legend of Maple the Walking and eventually Flying Fortress that ultimately draws more friends into her orbit. Progress which is marked at the end of each episode in Karomu's chat logs, which, side note, I wish were subtitled better. Focusing on these communal elements of MMOs only makes sense given that this show is one half moe comedy. Endearing character interactions are the whole point of that genre, after all. But it also puts the series in a unique position within the sphere of gaming anime. There is one other show about gamers running a guild out of a big treehouse, but Log Horizon more resembles a big corporation or mercenary outfit than the kind of guild your average MMO player might join. In Bofuri, Maple and Sally just buy a guild house so that they have a place to hang out and invite a few friends to join them because it seems like a fun thing to do. And through the process of them all having fun together, the Maple Tree Guild organically grows into something much bigger. I'd wager that for most of you watching this, aside from maybe the EVE Online players, Maple's story, oh, hey, is more representative of your experience with guild or clan systems in online games than that of the Machiavellian villain in glasses. Which isn't to say that Log Horizon's use of these ideas is bad, it's just different. That show is all about how we can use the skills we develop in online games to make a positive impact in our lives and the real world around us. Whereas Bofuri serves as a very gentle reminder that these games are still, at the end of the day, just games that exist primarily so that we can have fun with them and other people, and that we will generally have a better time with them if we focus on that instead of becoming obsessed with competing and winning. So Bofuri focuses on the aspects of online gaming that support its narrative goals as a slice-of-life moe thing, mostly playing the elements that don't for laughs, and in doing so, it finds a way to say something meaningful about the hobby as a whole. Which is really important, because if a piece of media about gaming doesn't actually have much to say about gaming, that's often a sign that its creators see video games more as a marketable aesthetic than a topic that merits proper artistic consideration in its own right. That said, from a character perspective, I think it's often more interesting to explore what games can say about the people playing them. Characters in fiction are defined by the choices they make, after all, and since games are all about making choices, if you design a fake game with interesting systems and mechanics for your characters to interact with, the way they do can tell us a lot of interesting things about them. Bofuri doesn't dive too much into mechanical minutia, so it can only really use this to define its characters in the broader strokes. Maple's decision to min-max defense reflects her nervousness and single-mindedness. Sally chooses a hard class to play because she's a competitive overachiever, and Kuromu plays a tank because he's a supportive kind of guy who really likes protecting other people, just to give a few examples. Most of the depth these characters have is found in how they interact with each other, not the game itself.
Infinite Dendrogram, with its fully sentient AI NPCs, blurs that line almost the second Ray Starling begins playing it, and it uses the attitudes that different players display toward the world's Tians, those fully sentient NPCs I just mentioned, as a sort of moral barometer. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. The series is very concerned with the minutia of how its titular game works. Most of the show so far has been about Ray slowly exploring its systems and figuring out exactly how he wants to play it. It. A question that's intrinsically tied to the question of what kind of hero he ultimately wants to be. The show reflects his initial indecision by keeping his character design in constant flux. Instead of picking a look and sticking with it, like a certain brooding trench coat boy, Ray is constantly changing out his gear for stuff with better stats and special effects and abilities that might alter his playstyle. You know, like how actual humans play MMOs. As a side note, the anime kind of glosses over a lot of these details, as well as some really important world-building stuff, including the central underlying mystery of the entire story. Yuichiro Momose, the series screenwriter, is kinda bad at his job, which isn't surprising given his other work. And while the original source material is strong enough that the show is entertaining in spite of him, I'd highly recommend reading it instead of watching it. And hey, on that side note, Bookwalker's currently running an Infinite Dendrogram Anime Fair promotion until March 3rd, where you can download the first three chapters for free to see how good it is for yourself. Plus, you can get a bundle of the first 10 volumes of the light novel for 20% off, which turns into nearly 30% when you use the promo code BASEMENT for an additional discount at checkout. Just saying, pretty good deals to be had. It's not just Ray who's defined by his playstyle. Every character he meets has their own approach to the game, and I think the series is at its most fun when it's exploring how these different gamers think. My favorite supporting character, out of the ones we've met so far anyway, is probably Hugo. We're introduced to this foppish, milady tip and knight type character in episode 5, and to anyone who's seen more than a handful of anime, his faux chivalrous pretty boy womanizing and unwarranted self-aggrandizing attitude will be, I think, immediately familiar. He's an ancient character archetype we've all seen done a million times over, one of the most tired, low-effort cliches in all of anime. But Infinite Dendrogram instantly makes that trope feel fresh and believable, because Hugo, you see, is role-playing. The real person behind this braggadocious Bashonen avatar is reserved, calculating, and guarded. They use the knight persona to create some distance between themselves and their fellow players, and from the at times existentially horrifying nature of the game itself. But deep down, they do really believe in the ideal their character represents, and like Ray, they care for the people of Infinite Dendrogram as though they were real. When pushed into a corner with lives on the line, their true, more serious, heroic nature outshines the silly character they've created. And I think the interplay between these two versions of Hugo in and out of the cockpit is fascinating. This is a character who could only ever really exist in the context of a hyper-realistic online game. So clearly, Infinite Dendrogram is using its premise for more than just broad nerd appeal. And it further enhances and accentuates Hugo's characterization through the embryo system. Embryos, remember, take form based on the actions, behavior, and subconscious brainwaves of their masters, so they serve double duty as cool weapons and symbolic representations of those masters' psychology. So when Hugo's embryo, Cocutus, takes the form of ice armor around whatever mech or vehicle he happens to be piloting, we can interpret that as the physical embodiment of his cold and defensive knightly facade. More broadly, as Hugo explains to Rey, the maiden type that both Cocutus and Nemesis fall into can only be created by masters who feel, on some level, that Infinite Dendrogram is not just a game, and that the lives of the sentient Tians matter just as much as those of real humans. Which maybe explains why these embryos tend to be so moe. Maidens represent a connection to and desire to protect characters who, ostensibly, are not real, and that's what Moe is all about. Maybe I'm reading too much into that, but it's clear how Ray's driving philosophy of seizing any possibility, no matter how slim, is reflected in Nemesis' ability to counter fatal damage and turn it back on bigger opponents, and how his desire to always make the best of a bad situation manifests itself in the power of her second form to reverse the effects of debuffs. And that's just talking about her powers. There's likewise meaning in her design, which evokes the faintly hopeful image of a lone candle flickering in the dark, 
and in her personality. The unwavering faith that Ray placed in his partner when he first called on her in episode one likely explains Nemesis' own unwavering self-confidence slash self-awareness that she is in fact just the best, because she's the best. Oh, Buki's Nemesis de is good. Nemesis de is good, but not. None of this is particularly deep or novel symbolism, but by baking it into the lore through the embryo system, Infinite Dendrogram encourages its audience to pay more attention to its characters' psychology and their actions than they otherwise might. The system also calls attention to the existence of other symbolism and subtext present in the series, like there sure are a lot of references to mythological figures associated with Hell and the Apocalypse in this game, for example. And in so doing, it acts almost as a tutorial for applying literary analysis to other parts of the text. Infinite Dendrogram is a series that really wants to be analyzed, interpreted, and interacted with by its audience, and its lore is designed to make those interactive elements as accessible as possible, I suspect intentionally, and if it is, that is some great integration of game design principles into a narrative. But putting all of that pretentious nerd crap aside, this idea also just works on a much more basic level. The embryo system is just hands down one of the coolest imaginary mechanics I've ever seen in a fake video game. The idea of a game generating a unique, basically stand for you based on your brainwaves is just so cool. It's totally tubular. I wanna play that game. You wanna play that game. Everyone would want to play that game. And that is the exact feeling that I want any escapist science fantasy about an impossible future video game to give me. Even as Bofuri pokes fun at New World Online's imbalanced design, railroaded quest chains, and lazily written NPCs that can't account for sequence breaks or cheese strategies, that last bit's instantly become one of my all-time favorite comedy anime gags, it still manages to sell that fantasy in its own way. The creators of New World Online may not be able to balance their game for shit, but they're real technical wizards in other regards, and they clearly built the game with a strong artistic vision in mind. Some of the dreamlike experiences the game offers, like the beach of eternal sunset or the cafe where you can eat and drink the night sky, would be worth the price of admission even if the game around them were completely broken. And looking at how Maple's been going, it may well get there someday. Games, both real and fictional, aren't simply vehicles for pure competition and systemic mastery. They're works of art that can sometimes stand on the strength of great aesthetics and interesting ideas alone. And New World Online undeniably has both strengths in spades. There are plenty of truly wondrous moments and locations in this show that make me think, I want to go there. I want to do that. Even the starting town is an appealing, lively, unique place that feels like it was ripped straight out of a fairy tale. In emphasizing these strengths at the expense of systems design and balance, New World Online kinda becomes the perfect setting for a moe anime. At the end of the day, this is a genre that aims to create a relaxed, inviting, playful atmosphere, and that just happens to be what this game does best. That appeal only succeeds, ultimately, thanks to the strength of the real artists and animators who brought Bofuri to life. If this show were a little less technically impressive and drop-dead gorgeous, I don't think it would work at all. And I'm not just talking about the beautiful world when I say that. Its characters are some of the most expressive and endearing of the season, and it seems like every other shot has the power to put a big ol' smile on my face with Maple doing something cute or someone else doing something cute or... Look, it's just, it's really cute, okay? At least during the dialogue scenes. As for the action scenes, they surprisingly rank among the best in this entire weird little subgenre, at least in terms of Sakuga and overall production values. Director Shin Onuma and his staff at Silverlink didn't let the fact that most of these fights don't really matter all that much stop them from giving every last one of them their all. On top of being visually impressive, they're shockingly well choreographed, usually with the intent of creating fun gags and character moments, but they can successfully build tension and genuine excitement as as well. And I think that they work on that level because while Bofuri leaves most of its game mechanics kinda loosely defined, it takes pains to introduce every skill and ability that Maple and Co. use in battle and to establish exactly how those mechanics work. Like a good real video game, the show starts Maple off with a few basic, easy to understand moves, but 
each episode introduces new ones organically as the crew earns them by leveling up and completing quests and dungeons. The characters' skill sets, and thus the strategies they can employ in battle, become increasingly complex as the series goes on, but in each fight, you only ever have to worry about the one or two new ones that were just thrown into the mix this episode. As a result, it's never too difficult to follow what the heroes are doing or to understand how they earned victory in any given encounter. Beneath all the cute antics, there's solid strategy at play here. Other types of anime can create this dynamic in their action through different means. It's the whole point of shonen power scaling, but I think the whole fake video game concept is uniquely well suited to achieving it. Bofuri leverages this principle to fit kick-ass, climactic feeling battles into a moe club show without diminishing the impact of either element. That's really impressive. As you can probably imagine, this works even better in a series where combat is actually the focus. Infinite Dendrogram's production values leave a fair bit to be desired, honestly. But even though its action scenes look a little stiff in places, they still manage to feel exciting and tense because the show gives us an intimate understanding of what Ray Starling can and can't do within the mechanics of the game. Nemesis has some mighty overpowered abilities, but each one also has clear, well-defined drawbacks that Ray has to work around. In each fight, we see him thinking about how to mitigate these downsides while also planning around the unique offensive abilities of his opponent and trying to suss out the right time to deliver a killing blow with Vengeance is Mine. The gear he acquires to augment his fighting abilities works on similar principles, and the series makes a point of showing him practicing with these new combat mechanics before using them in real fights. If you follow the exposition and have a basic understanding of universal RPG elements like potions, health, and aggro, you can almost always understand what the characters in any given fight are doing and why. And outside of the two moments where Ray pulls a new power out of his ass, which feels cheap even if there is a story explanation for how and why he can do that, it's often possible to anticipate what strategy he and Nemesis will use to win early on. Of course, half the fun is seeing how he gets there. Again, this is similar to one of the underlying principles that makes many shonen battle anime so fun and engaging. The puzzle fight dynamic seen in JoJo and My Hero Academia, where the clash of unique inventive power sets and fun limitations creates interesting problems for the protagonist and audience to solve together. That also happens to be exactly what a good boss fight is, and it's the key to making a good PvP system as well. It turns out that simply putting in the effort to design a good fake video game, or at least a good fake combat system, is also a great way to lay the groundwork for good fight scenes. And that sounds pretty obvious when I say it out loud, but SAO never bothered to do it, so I guess it's not quite obvious enough. There are many ways that the principles and logic of game design and game writing can be used to improve other forms of storytelling. And they needn't be limited to stories about games. I mean, ReZero manages to turn the psychology of its characters and the political concerns of an entire nation into a massive game-like possibility space simply by introducing a checkpoint system to its linear isekai narrative. For all I've said today, I've barely scratched the surface surface of what's possible when writers explore these concepts in earnest, but I do still think that we can draw some useful conclusions from what we've seen today that can be applied to a wide range of stories about games, not just VR MMOs. When building a story around a fake game, making a game that simply seems like it would be fun to play on paper is a great way of enhancing your title's general gamer appeal, but it's more important to identify what kind of story you're trying to tell and to figure out what kind of game would best support that than it is to just try to make the most fun thing you can imagine. A complex, sophisticated VR MMO is a great fit for an epic character-driven story, but for a comedy, a janky, bodged-together game with a quirky aesthetic might work a lot better. If you're writing a horror story, a survival horror game might be just what you need, or it might pay to explore the creepy potential of bugs and glitches in a less polished title from any other genre. For a red-blooded sports drama, you might want to look at real-world competitive games like shooters, MOBAs, or fighting games. And if your goal is to tell a sweet coming-of-age story, life sims or social games could be used to construct fascinating parallels with the real-world struggles your characters are facing. The possibilities are as broad and diverse as the gaming market itself. Just this season, Darwin's game has demonstrated how the predatory nature of mobile games with cash shops and the collaborative dynamics of ARGs can spice up an otherwise conventional super-powered battle royale narrative. 
Once you've settled on the type of fake game you want to make, you'll need to build systems and mechanics into it. Again, I think it pays to make those as fun as you can, but it's more important that they be interesting for your characters to interact with. And what that means will change depending on the genre you're writing in. Infinite Dendrogram benefits from giving Ray Starling many chances to run off and be a hero, while Bofuri succeeds by rewarding Maple and her friends for just goofing off and having fun. The more research you do into game design, the more convincing your fake game will be, but at the end of the day, the story you're telling has to come first. Regardless of what your exact narrative goals are, if you design your fake game with those goals in mind, I think you'll be on the right track. Now, if you want to learn more about game design, it is a real fun topic to research. I made a whole video about the fake design of SAO and another one theory crafting a sort of potential Made in Abyss video game, so check those out if you'd like to hear more from me on the subject. As for me, I'm gonna go research the shit out of Judgment. Yakuza meets Phoenix Wright? Yes, please. I'm Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, signing out from my mother's basement.